HTZ back. Thank you, Tom. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, read the uh, treasurer's report tonight. I understand because uh, I don't believe Ken is on the radio. I think he's just on on Zoom. So uh, for those of you who are for those of you who are on the uh, repeater, Ken, I'll go ahead and read the treasurer's report. Before we do that, let's take the uh, uh, minutes of the last uh, meeting and get approved. And the way we've been customarily doing this is that if um, Stand by. I'm admitting somebody. Uh, if if the uh, if the person um, uh, wishes to vote, uh, I mean to uh, st offer a correction to the minutes, then um, we'll um, ask you to check in uh, with on the radio or on Zoom, whatever. If there's no uh, corrections to be made, then I will go ahead and and uh, and, and say that if, if everybody that's in favor don't say anything, and anybody that's not in favor or that has a correction to speak up. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but uh, let's try it that way. Um, so, if everybody's seen the if everybody's seen the minutes, let's uh, let's go ahead and take a vote on um, if there's any corrections to be made. Speak up now. All right. In that, in that case, I'll go ahead and ask that anyone uh, who wishes to vote against uh, minutes do so. If not, uh, your uh, Lack of any uh, response here will be a, a, will be a <coughs> positive response. All right, I, I guess we can go ahead and assume that the minutes are accepted. Um, for anybody who wishes to come in, um, who's on the radio and wants to come into the Zoom meeting, if you check our website, the RARC website, there's an instruction on there with a link that'll get you right into the Zoom meeting if you'd like to join us on Zoom. Okay, I'll now go ahead and, and uh, read the treasurer's report. Um, we are, let's see if I can understand this. Uh, we have Twelve thousand nine hundred one dollars and fifty one cents in the bank in the checking account right now. Last month we had, or this past month we had one hundred twenty six dollars and seventy seven cents of expenses, which uh, was a uh, we had one bad check. We had a bank fee. We had a a, 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 de a debit card extra uh, uh, purchase extra manuals, and that's the uh, managers we give to the Chesterfield Library and the radio keeps cutting out. Uh, the Chesterfield Library and the Henrico Library, I believe we bought two uh, new uh, extra class uh, license manuals for. Uh, and then we also collected dues, um, <clears throat> $30 and $50 worth of dues. And the balance that came forward from last month was twelve nine forty eight twenty eight. So um, total expenses one twenty six seventy seven, and the current balance is twelve thousand nine hundred one fifty one. And if there's any uh, correction to that, Ken, let me know. Okay, this is K5HTZ for identification. Let's go ahead and move to the next uh, item of business. I will, um, I think we have a new member. Let me see what, uh, stand by while I check my paperwork here. We have one new member that came in uh, and we also have uh, Steve Bowles, uh, who was previously WB4SED has now changed his call to W4SB. So take a make note of that. Uh, Ken, do you have the information on who the new member is? I'm looking for it and I can't find it. I, I do. It's a, a Robert Boomer, KM4BHT, who's a technician. Is that, that's KM4BHT? KM4BHT, yes. BHT. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know what's the problem with my radio, but I'm going to try this again. K5HTZ HTZ for identification. We have one new member to consider, uh, KM4BHT. Um, uh, he's a technician, wishes to join. Can we take a vote? Uh, anybody who's opposed to it, please yes, speak up. If not, if not we'll, we'll assume that uh, you are uh, in favor of it. <clears throat> John, also James Maddox. They came in on Friday. Okay, K4CMK has moved to accept it. And do I have a second from anybody? Second. Okay, we have a second on Zoom. So uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, take a vote. All in favor? 
<clears throat> Aye. Aye. Uh, anyone opposed? Okay, K KM4 BHT's membership is accepted. All right. All right, we have a couple of announcements that I want to make. Uh, I'm hoping that the radio holds out here. Um, first of all, we have somebody who is a, a real estate agent contacted us. He's selling a house for, for somebody who's a ham, and there's a 48-foot antenna tower in the yard uh, that they want to give away. So um, he's asking for somebody to, uh, if you're interested, to come take the tower, to make arrangements to take the tower. Um, he also is offering, uh, the question had come up about liability insurance, about going on the property and removing and removing the tower. And um, so um, what he's proposing is he has a contractor. If you want the tower, he can make arrangements with the contractor to take it down for you. So if anybody's interested in a 48 foot tower or some pieces thereof, <clears throat> call or an email and I'll put you in touch with the agent. All right, um, the, um, can I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and if anyone wants to go get the tower themselves and they're just worried about liability, they want to disassemble and everything, I'm our state registered contractor. I'll cover it with the liability for my company. Okay, I'm looking, who are you? K4YXL. K4YXL. Okay, something that came through on Zoom just now, K5HTZ again. Um, K4YXL is on Zoom, and he said he's a uh, registered tower uh, person, and if somebody's interested in, in getting the tower, uh, you can talk to him, and he'll help you get it down. <clears throat> All right. Let me check my notes here and see what else I have on the agenda. Um, I think that's it for my reports. Um, do we have anybody else who has uh, wants to make a report or has some information for us? Okay, Ken, go ahead. Uh, um, I'd like to uh, let everyone know that the Radio Builders Group will meet this next Tuesday on Zoom. Uh, I will be sending out a uh, email uh, for the link for it, uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, some things that we can talk about. We don't have any current new projects because of not having meetings in person. We've kind of lost, you know, some of the momentum that we had with building things. Our last project, you know, was the, the uh, FT8 machines that we built. We've got a number of them that are working successfully and we have uh, a number of them uh, that need some modification, need some help. Uh, mine, uh, I cannot get working, and it's a problem because those I, of you on, uh, on the Mike, network right now, I'm in on the, uh, it was the repeater working, right now. Uh, Mike, uh, Ken Leitner is, is, I mean, Ken Zuderverne is making uh, an announcement. I need some contacts with it, you know, so I know what this that is. This is K5HTZ. Uh, Rick needs some plates, uh, front and front and back plates for his. Uh, I think I, I can take mine off and see if I can make a copy of it out of some uh, sheet metal that I have, Rick. And That'd be good. If I can put that together. And yeah, I figured you could probably do that. Yeah, you have something that you can hold your case, uh, at least hold it. Just right. Guts in the case there. Um, there is, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for some parts uh, to build some uh, Fox uh, hunt receivers. Uh, uh, the uh, Richmond, uh, the 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 uh, uh, rats uh, group approached me a while back and said it'd be kind of neat to uh, have them at Frostfest, you know, either to sell them as a kit or sell them pre-built or something. Uh, see what you can come up with, you know, something's cheap, reasonable, and so I'm going to try and do that using uh, a uh, integrated circuit that's basically uh, a one-chip receiver. Uh, FM and uh, try and see if I can build, put together a really cheap unit. I've got the ICs on order from China. Uh, there's a month delay, almost almost anything coming through, uh, but that's kind of interesting. Uh, I've, I've never done any fox hunting, so I need to get together with some people that have experience with that 
Uh, Bill, I think you've done some of that, haven't you? And, and Bruce has done some of that. Uh, but I'll also uh, get together with maybe, you know, the Powhatan group, uh, see how selective and sensitive it is and see if it really works. What's uh, the term you're using, Ken? Pot stuffing? Would you... Fox, Fox and Hounds Hunt. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Fox and Hounds Hunt. Got it. Big, big in Europe, but they use 80 meters, you know. Right. And and here uh, in the U.S., I think it's almost all uh, two meter. Kind right. of stuff. So anyway, the, so there's some ideas, and the other thing too is one of the purpose for uh, us getting together. A lot of times, people come up with an idea and say, "Hey, you know, have, have we thought about doing something like this?" Or here's a new new product uh, or something coming out. Uh, uh, Bruce uh, has been uh, doing an awful lot of stuff with his Raspberry Pi and and and. Uh, Connecting and getting into FD8 and working with through a lot of problems of audio, and it'd be you know interesting to hear you know it, kind of a longer discussion on some of that. Uh, you know, so we we uh, you know have things that we can think about and do, uh, and see what we can you know get together and and uh, generate ideas and gives us uh, something to then work on in our seclusion. Um, fortunately, you know, Amazon is there, so we, I, I, at least I can still get parts and stuff like that. So that helps. Of course, my wife keeps complaining about the mail coming in, but hey, what the heck? Anyway, uh, Tuesday, I will send out the, uh, the notice, uh, tomorrow on Saturday. Thank you. 25 HTZ back again on the, uh, repeater and on, on Zoom. Um, uh, I have one other announcement, well, actually a couple other announcements I wanted to make. Um, for those of you who, um, the Virginia QSO party has uh, come up finally with a an awards night that they're going to do a, on a virtual awards night. So if anybody has not gotten that message through, um, through them directly by email, uh, you can give me an email or a call and I will, I will uh, go ahead and uh, forward this message to you if you're interested, if you have any uh any interest in it, in it uh, or have an award coming to you. Um, let's see, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, we don't know for sure when we're gonna be able to get back into our uh, the church where we normally meet. And considering that it's getting close to time or will be sometime uh, soon uh, to, to start thinking about the uh, fall classes, uh, the club is gonna go ahead and purchase a, uh, a Zoom license that'll allow uh, the instructors the instructors to go ahead and, and uh, conduct the classes by uh, but through zoom and uh, we still don't know about the licensing that's going to be alan uh, alan johnson's thing but uh, we, we probably will end up trying to do something to give tests again so uh, if alan's around I, i'll let him comment on that but uh, if not we we are definitely working on trying to get something together so that you can uh we can take our cl have our classes in the fall the other thing too is um we have we have a lot of equipment that's been donated to us and a lot of parts, um, things that came from successions and people downsizing, K5-HTZ for identification. Uh, we, we are trying to figure out how to have a flea market. So um, if anybody has any ideas or anything, to pl a place where we might be able to set up and have a flea market or something, talk to me about it and we'll see if we can work out something because we really don't know when we're going to be able to get back into church again. And personally, my house is full of stuff that belongs to the club that I'd like to put into in the flea market and get it out of here so I can use my house again. Okay, K5HTZ, I'm going to go ahead back to the, uh, the Zoom meeting. Excuse me. Hi. Um, do you think that we could at least use the parking lot of the church as there's like... W3DH, standby. Oh. Uh, yeah, Judy, I think that's a might be a, I mean, it's, it's a Tom question. Uh, something like that might be a possibility. Yeah, um, cause on the far side, there's a ton of room. Yeah, I mean, if not there, some other parking lot, maybe or something. I don't know. We'll we'll figure out something. But I'd l definitely like to have a sale before the, <clears throat> the end of the year. Uh, I have W5DH checking in on the uh, repeater. Uh, go ahead, W5DH. WJ3H, go ahead, K5HTZ.
Okay, thank you very much. K5 HTZ standing by again. Um, okay, what, what the, that message on the repeater was about is that um, the Rats Club apparently is going to try to uh, go ahead and test on the 27th. Uh, they are uh, waiting on the uh, Henrico County to tell them, <coughs> excuse me, if they can use the pavilion, but they're planning on uh, trying to test on the 27th since field days canceled or modified or whatever it is this year. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, don't forget to uh, I put my application in and, and all that. Y'all can put my application down. And, uh, so I, I don't know. I Tom, did you get that call? Okay, and your question was, did they receive your application? Okay, are you, you, you are a new member? I'm trying to get back into the club. Okay, uh, I have a, a K, K, KG4AXO, I think it is. Yeah, Roger. Okay, K, KG4AXO is reapplying to the club. Uh, to reinstate his membership. So uh, we, if, if we can, I'd like to take a vote and go ahead and vote him back in. Yay. Okay, anyone opposed to, to, to voting him back in? Okay, all in favor, uh, respond by not responding. Anybody opposed? And uh, you are accepted back into the club. Congratulations. Welcome back. John, who was yeah. that? KG4CMK. Wait, no, I'm sorry. KG4AXO. AXO. AXO. A AXO. That's James Maddox, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah we've got him. Okay. Okay, good. We, we have you on the register, so you're back in the club. All right, K5HTZ, I'm going to stand by on a repeater for a few minutes while I do a show and tell and check and see if there's any other reports coming in on Zoom. If anybody has reports that they need to give us by way of the repeater, uh, please stand by and I'll call for those in a second. All right, anybody on Zoom got a reports or anything else that you want to give us? Okay, nothing heard. Uh, anyone on the repeater have a report that they need to give us? K5 H HTZ in the net. This is K5HTZ. Uh, Bruce indicated everything is back up with the club station.
Thank you, Bruce. W4BRU says K5HTZ back. Um, all right. Is there anyone else that has reports for us tonight? Okay. I'm going to stand by on a repeated and I'm going to do a show and tell on Zoom. All right, guys. I picked this up a couple of weeks ago. This is the first portable radio that was made. Of the first run of portable radios, I should say. Um, it's an RCA made in 1925. It uses six UX199 tubes, 45 volt B battery, four and a half volt A battery, and uh, I mean C battery, and a, a, a one and a half volt A battery. It has a built in Horn speaker which I'll try to show you in a minute if I can share the desktop and show you a picture of it because I can't disassemble the radio right now to show you. But um, this predated the fatter portable, which was supposedly one of the first portables. Um, it's an interesting radio. One of the interesting things about it, too, is that the antenna is built into the door. And as you can see, the door closes, but the antenna swings independent of the door so that you can direct it at a station. I'm going to go ahead and try to um, share my desktop so that I can show you the uh, what the speaker looks like in it. That's what the Horn speaker looks like. It's in the bottom bottom section of the case. Wow. Interesting little radio. Okay, so <clears throat> is there any uh, anybody else has anything for us tonight other than the presentation? Go ahead, again with the uh, RARC meeting. Um, we're uh, going to go ahead and close the business portion of the meeting if there's no other comments or, or anything, did any, any business. I have a, I have a question. Uh, stand by. Yes, Judy. Um, uh, how long did it take for it to go from your radio to the one that they carried in the military? In, 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 the, mili the first military one was... Uh, in 1917, but it was not, uh, it was a crystal set, from what I understand. It wasn't a tube radio. This is what, when, when I said portable, it's the first tube, one of the first tube portables. And they did have, they did have uh, uh, CW, uh, CW stuff working through telephone lines in the, uh, in World War, World War I. Good Thank comment. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if there's no other comments, then I'll go ahead and turn it back over to KN4CMK to um, close the, the uh, net down, and we're going to go to the presentation. If you'd like to join us for the presentation, which tonight is uh, Dr. Rick Wallace going to give us a talk on uh, uh, pacemakers and uh, radio, the effect of, of uh, radio frequency uh, radiation with the human body, uh, if you'd like to join us on Zoom for that presentation uh, and you don't have the link, uh, our link is on the on the uh, uh, RAMC <clears throat> website. Um, Tom, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. This is K5HTZ clear. K8408. John asked me to speak about ham radio and pacemakers, and I, I think that's a good topic because um, hams are older people and the incidence of heart disease goes up in older people. So um, if I were doing this live, I would ask for a show of hands of how many people have some type of implantable cardiac device, but I'm assuming it's quite a few people. So the comments that I'm going to make are general informational comments. Um, they're not meant to represent any kind of specific medical information. Uh, so if anyone has a question about their particular situation or their particular device, they should speak to their cardiologist. The, uh, if, they, if the manufacturers have engineers that are available, um, and you can go to the website of your device manufacturer, and they'll, they can give you a link to an engineer, and they can answer specific questions about your device. A lot, a lot of those engineers are hams themselves, and so they can, they can get, they're very informative in that regard. Um, also, if you're really not sure about what the RF environment is in your shack, sometimes an experienced ham can come by and, and investigate that for you. So what I'm going to start by doing is showing just some basic slides about cardiac anatomy, physiology, uh, why people need pacemakers, about the types of pacemakers, and also I'll talk about implantable defibrillators, and um, then we'll talk about the uh, ham radio. So let's, let me see if I can get these slides up here. Okay. Now we're seeing it. Now we're seeing it. Yeah. Could, you, could you go back and say what you said? <laughs> you mean everything? 
No, just the early part. All right. I talked about, so they're asking me to admit Daniel, so I'm admitting Daniel. I talked about the normal anatomy of the heart. And so is everyone seeing that? Yeah. This picture, so human beings have four chambers. There is the two atria, right atrium, left atrium. Those are low pressure receiving chambers of the heart. And then they have the ventricles, which are high pressure pumping chambers of the heart. And you can see here that the muscles and the ventricles are big because they're, they're hard pumping. So when the body uh, uses all the oxygen from the blood, it returns to the um, right atrium. The white atrium contracts through the tricuspid valve, puts the blood into the right ventricle. When the right ventricle contracts, it closes the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve is not shown here, but the pulmonary valve uh, shoots the blood out into the pulmonary artery, which goes to each lungs, each lung, and then the, the lung oxygenates the blood. Then it comes back from the heart through the pulp, from the lungs through the pulmonary veins into the right atrium, goes through the mitral valve. And then when the ventricle fills, now the important thing is the ventricle needs to have time to fill before it contracts. That's why the atrium has to contract first, then the ventricle. And so when the ventricle contracts, the mitral valve is closed and blood is ejected through the, into the, through the aortic valve into the aorta. So um, what happens as a result of organic heart disease is some people get what's called conducting system disease. And so this is the conducting system of the heart. This is the, what's called the sinoatrial node. The conduction system of the heart consists of modified muscles. So the sinoatrial node is the biological pacemaker of the heart. The sinoatrial nerve receives impulses from other parts of the body. So um, let's say, for example, if you exercise, it increases your heart rate. Um, if you're resting, it's slower. So then from the sinoatrial node, it goes to the atrioventricular node. And what this does is provide a little delay in conduction to allow the atria to contract first and then a while after the ventricles. And then from there are the, are the uh, bundle branches. And there is the right bundle branch, which goes to the right ventricle. There's the left bundle branch, which goes to the left ventricle. And this has an anterior posterior branch. So conducting system disease can consist of failure of the heart's biologic pacemaker or trouble in the conducting system. And if you don't get, if you don't have a normal signal for your heart to beat, the ventricles down here won't pump blood normally and you will faint or other bad things will happen or die. The other thing that happens is the ventricles themselves, usually in the, or the conduction system, usually in the setting of, of coronary artery disease can become damaged and the, the ventricles will, will take off under their own rhythm, which is called ventricular tachycardia, or a may make more chaotic rhythm may ensue, which is called ventricular fibrillation, where the different muscles in the heart are contracting uh, like a bag of worms. And that's uh, what causes sudden death. So you don't want that to happen. You'll see if I can get the next So <clears throat> These are the indications for permanent pacemaker. And um, the first one is acquired atrioventricular. Uh, we talked about acquired atrioventricular block or conduct conduction system disease, um, second degree, uh, there's what's called first degree heart block. I won't get into all that, but second degree heart block is where you have some beats to get through and others don't. Um, third degree heart block is where there's no conduction of beats from the atrium to the ventricle. Um, and then sometimes, whoops, after a heart attack, you might need one. And then um, by, by, uh, fascicular, trifascicular block means uh, bundle branch disease. And then sinus node dysfunction, um, different reasons why the um, heart is not transmitting its uh, beat. So that, that's the reason for a pacemaker. Now, let's see if I can make the next one come up. And these are the um, indications for an implantable defibrillator. So uh, if people have, these are the indications for people who have not had an event. So if you have um, heart disease and your heart is not emptying, has a low ejection fraction. If you have a history of a heart attack, uh, normally the, what the ejection fraction is, is there's a certain volume of blood in the ventricle in diastole. 
and then when the heart contracts, it ejects a fraction of that blood. So it normally you should eject at least 50% of that blood. If somebody has a bad heart, then they inject less than that. So um, if you have an ejection fraction of 30%, then 70% of the blood is still remaining in your left ventricle after it contracts and that, that causes problems like fainting and low blood pressure. Um, if somebody faints for no reason, if their electrophysiologist can induce dangerous rhythms uh, by electrophysiology study, and then there are certain condition, hereditary conditions called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and long QT syndrome. Now, if someone has ever had an episode of ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, which are life-threatening rhythms, that's, that would also be another reason to have an implanted defibrillator. Um, now, um, there are different kinds of pacemakers. There are one-chamber pacemakers, there are two-chamber pacemakers. Um, if you just have sinus disease with normal conduction system, you maybe can just use an atrial pacemaker. If you have sinus disease and conduction system, you might have a two-chamber um, two pacemaker. It just depends on what the particular form of heart disease you have is. Now this is a picture of the normal heartbeat, and this is called the P wave. Um, this little thing here is called the Q wave, R, S. This is called the ST segment. Some of you with coronary artery disease may have heard discussion of ST segment elevation, and this is called the T wave. What the P wave is is a contraction of the atrium, followed by a period of time. The QRS wave is the contraction of the ventricle, then there's a latency period and then the ventricle depolarizes. So this is the normal P wave that's conducted normally um, through the system. Hmm. All right, now this is a paced heart rhythm. And so in this case, now this person actually has P waves, but uh, what you, this spike here is the pacer spike. So this person, now they used to have um, what are called uh, asynchronous pacemakers, which meant that the, the, the pacemaker sent out a beat whether your heart needed or not. Most heart pacemakers now are what are called synchronous pacemakers, meaning that they are set to deliver a beat to your heart if your heart rate drops below a certain um, 70, 72 beats a minute, depending on how it was set by your cardiologist. So that's what a paced rhythm looks like. To my other slides here without inking the whole thing out. All right. Let's see if I can bring up the next group of slides I want to show you. Now, um, a lot of the next slides I'm going to show you, um, if you uh, search ham radio pacemaker, the ARRL has a site, and on that site there are links to uh, several major pacemaker manufacturers, St. Jude's, Medtronic, um, Boston Medical. So all of these slides I'm going to show you are from those uh, sources. So you can link, link up there. Okay, anyone seeing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see it. So it says um, problems with electromagnetic interference are rare. Uh, manufacturers are do, try to do a good job to protect people. Um, now, the normal frequencies in the heart, and I kind of question this lower figure, they say 10 hertz to 100 hertz. But I would say if your pulse is 60 beats a minute, that's, that seems to me that would be one hertz. So anyway, the, the electrical frequencies in the heart are below 100 hertz. So the pacemakers have a bandpass filter so that frequencies um, above this range don't get into the pacemaker. But in every other case of filtering, um, sometimes you can, the filter can be overwhelmed if the interference signal is too powerful. <clears throat> so there's a couple of ways that there's electromagnetic interference. Um, galvanic interference means a direct contact with electrical current, and typically that would happen if you're getting cardioverted or some other electrical stimulators. Magnetic interference occurs when you're clo in close proximity to a strong magnetic field, and this is typically um, would be with an MRI machine, which is why uh, people with certain pacemakers cannot um, go in an MRI machine. Uh, and then what I'm going to um, 
emphasizes electromagnetic interference. And this is coming from a different device, many different devices, but particularly radio transmitters. And the thing that's interesting about uh, radio waves is a sustained carrier doesn't bother the heart very much. It's a pulse carrier, like a microphone click keying or modulated RF has a, a much more significant effect on the heart than, um, than unmodulated carrier. Mm. So this is just another, this was from St. Jude and the and what the, the effects that you can have on your device is it can, the radio pulse can make your pacemaker think that your heart has delivered a beat, so it won't deliver one. It may deliver an extra beat. It may cause your heart rate to go too slow, too fast. Uh, in the case of the defibrillator, it may, um, uh, may deliver a shock when you don't need one or may not deliver one when you need one. And usually those effects occur while the, you know, during the duration of the radio wave. And then I'm going to go show you another slide from Medtronic. This is a slide from Medtronic and basically they re reiterate the same thing that implanted devices are highly high of a highly selective filter and it shows the, the ways that um, it can cause a falsely deliver a shock or inappropriate sensing. And so it can cause things you don't want to happen. So then they have a breakdown here and it's basically it's related to the power of the device in question. But other things that also need to be taken into consideration would be if you have a gain antenna, if that's aimed at you, um, what the polar, you know, what the, um, polarity of the wave is, it, it may have to do with the, the specific um, way the electrodes are set up in your pacemaker. So these are guidelines, but you can see these guidelines are based on power. And the, basically the figure they're concerned about is a field of 100 volts a meter or 100 volts per meter. So the higher the power, the further away from your uh, device you want it to be. Now, John mentioned that, um, can everybody still hear me? Yeah, we hear you. John mentioned he's gonna get a kilowatt amplifier. So if John has a kilowatt amplifier, he needs to be at least 30 feet away from his antenna and maybe more if um, uh, he has a directional antenna. And um, the other thing is if you got a, two, a kilowatt amplifier and you take the cover off, then that might expose you to a more, uh, a more powerful field. So basically it's a question of distance. But again, it, with your, your regard to your um, specific device, you want to um, consult your manufacturer about your specific device. Now, there's a whole, Boston Scientific has a whole big list of everything you can possibly imagine. And I'll just show you some of them. But every every possible electrical device they have, it goes on for pages and pages. And they, they give you the precautions there. This goes on for pages and pages. But this um, is available. You can get that information from um, the manufacturer's website. I have a question. Hold on, hold on one second. All right, so that's that again. Um, let me see, there's another one I wanted to show you. I'm going to, I'm going to take your question in a minute, but there's another one I wanted to show you. I, there's another way to look at this. Um, I'm trying to find that slide. one is that over here okay so this just re reiterates a dis the distance issue but there's other ways to look at it um, they talk about this isn't radio necessarily but they talk about electric fields 6,000 volts a meter 
um, that's at low frequency. Um, at high frequency, there's your figure of 100 volts a meter, but then they also talk about modulated magnetic fields, and they stipulate they're specified that in Gauss or amps per meter or static magnetic fields. So that gets into thing that um, is really beyond the uh, realm of radio. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say, you don't want to hold your HT up against your pacemaker and key it, um, and you should you know, be aware of what your particular setting is in your station. And if you have a specific question about your device, um, you need to you would speak to your cardiologist or consult a manufacturer's representative. Now, who had the question? Uh, this is Ken. Um, okay, Ken. My, my question is, um, you're considered more about the power because you're worried about overloading the pacemaker. Yes, it's, you know, it's related to the, it's power and distance. Okay, as opposed to the frequency that you're at. Right. Because any, you can, I mean, I don't know there is an upper limit on frequency, but it's enough RF of any frequency. It's the transient that seems to be the issue. When you key a microphone, when you key a Morse code key, when you, when you modulate the RF, it's the transient that shows up like that pacer spike. And it just fool, it fools the equipment into detecting something that's not there or not responding to something that is there. But the reason it's, it's, the, it's distance and power because of the inverse square law of how um, RF degenerates over distance. Another question? No more questions, huh? Yeah, I've got a question. Right, fire. Um, gosh, I forgot what it was and I should have wrote it down. <laughs> I also specialize in memory problems. <laughs> Rick, on, on, on the bundle branch block, I, I have a left bundle branch block. Right. I, I have PVCs and PACs. Right. And dropped heartbeats. What right. is uh, if, if if without without having to have a pacemaker, do I have any issues? To, as far well, as RF I think uh, there's the there's two left bundles. There's an anterior. Some people have what's called an anterior hemi block or a posterior hemi block. And again, I'm not I'm not a cardiologist, but I think if you just have an uh, anterior, like a single fascicular block, it's not a big deal because you're still getting some conduction from the other. Um, posterior anterior branch. If you have two, if you have a bifascicular, meaning the right and left are blocked, or all three are blocked, that's when you have an issue. The PACs and PVCs in and of themselves are not dangerous, but there are people that have what are called supraventricular tachycardia, which is where the atrium beats too fast, and then there's PVCs occurring in isolation are common and not that unusual. It's when they serialize, you know, after Again, I'm not a cardiologist, but after eight or 10 beats of ventricular beats, then you worry about ventricular fibrillation, which is where the ventricles are beating so fast they cannot pump blood normally. Right. The heart cannot go too fast or lose effectiveness in pumping blood. Okay. I remember what my question was. All right, go ahead. Does the pacemaker have a recovery uh, rate and, uh, or could there be permanent problems? Um, usually it recovers as, as soon as the stimulus is gone, the pacemaker recovers. Now, I suppose in a really bad situation, you could fry the innards of your pacemaker. I've never heard of that happening, but um, that, that, I guess, is a theoretical possibility in a really high field. Ken, did you have a question? I have a question, Rick. Uh, I had uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, right back and in the hospital and they did a cardial version on me and I understand that that involved them putting a defibrillator on me and stopping my heart uh, and then you know for some period or whatever and then the defibrillator again and starting it up it's sort of like resetting that node or what yes yeah, so in other words the um, the heart heart has intrinsic rhythmicity and when you have a tachycardia, and even in the setting of if you have um, the implantable defibrillator, the first thing it does is give a series of pulses to try to resynchronize the heart. Okay. If that does not revert you to a regular heartbeat, then it will shock your heart. No, I don't have a defibrillator. I, I mean, I don't have a. a well, uh, what that what basically a shock does is is kind of erase the slate on your heart and knock out all the aberrant rhythms and, and then let the natural. Rhythmicity, try to start up again. Technically, was I dead? 
Um, <laughs> how good is your cardiologist? <laughs> are, you, are you still sending me bills? <laughs> uh, no, I would not say you were not technically dead. Oh. I mean, you're, no. You know, there, there are different things they do with atrial fibrillation. Another thing they do is ablation, um, which is where they um, go in and destroy tissue around in the, in the left atrium where the pulmonary veins come in, and that's, that tissue is felt to be arrhythmogenic, and that's a different story altogether. But um, That was the next plan. That was plan B. Because yeah. atrial fibrillation is not a good thing, and it's not a good thing particularly in the left ventricle because it allows blood to stagnate in that ventricle and forms clots, which then get shot out into the rest of the body, including the brain, causing a stroke. So that's why um, not uncommonly people are anticoagulated with yeah. warfarin or some of the newer ones to reduce, and that significantly reduces your risk of having a stroke. Yeah, so that's why I'm on blood thinners again. Huh? Right, right, exactly. That re that's substantially reduces your risk of having a stroke. Interesting. Well, I think this has been a very interesting presentation for considering that most of us have enough RF around to cause problems. You know, I think the take home message is these devices are pretty safe, but better to be safe than sorry in terms of what you do. Yeah. yeah. Rick? Yep. Um, Spruce. Um, I have a friend of mine, we, we work over at Science Museum and we use Vandegraaff generators and, uh, you know, Tesla coil kind of things. Yeah. He got a pacemaker put in and they kept, they said it wasn't safe for him to use that anymore. Um, well, parking and everything. Um, you have to ask what's happening there. And um, I guess you'd have to ask what the electric field is um, around that generator. You could probably measure it. It's a, uh, it basically is uh, man-made lightning, but low, 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 low amperage lightning, but fairly high voltage. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I couldn't speculate, but I think you'd have to, you could have some, I think a flute makes a, an electric field measuring device. So I think you just need to measure the electric field. Now, if you go back to that um, slide I showed you from Boston, I don't know whether Boston Scientific mentioned um, Tesla coils, but it mentioned just about everything else. Okay, that's a good idea. But I think it just depends on, it just depends on the energy involved. He, he I mean, I guess you could ask yourself the question that a, a lightning volt, bolt that's um, a million volts hits in your backyard, and that's probably a much, much, much higher electric field, and that doesn't shut your pacemaker off. So, well, he particularly he particularly liked giving that particular demonstration, and so we. Yeah, no, but if you think about natural lightning and the field strength from that, mm -hmm. or then uh, I think that's hard. You know. Uh, a, a Tesla or Van de Graaff, particularly a Van de Graaff, doesn't compare. Right. Well, I think that was that a question about that. I'd call your pay, your pacemaker company and ask them to talk to the engineer, and, and and they can give you specific information on that. Yeah, I think that's the thing I'll suggest to them. That's good. Thanks. Sure. Everybody, start still beating. <laughs> Any other questions? I think you've given us a good idea. All right. Well, thank you, Rick. Like I, I said, you can link to these slides, or you can link just if you just search ham radio pacemaker. The air has a site that with links to with most of these things I've just shown you. Well, we really, we really appreciate you putting yeah. us together. My pleasure. Us. That was awesome. Thank you so much. See, Judy, you're too young to worry about it. <clears throat> Hello. Hey, this year is a big six so I can't wait. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, organic heart disease, coronary heart disease, that's uh, the cause of most of it. So, well, my, Mine was caused by a direct lightning strike. Seriously? Yeah, when I was 16 years old. My heart's wow. never been right since. Mm. Well, you know, that, that's how lightning kills people, by the way. Um, yeah. It causes a cardiac arrest. And that's why when I used to be a Boy Scout leader, and we were hiking up on the mountains, I told people to stay about 20 feet apart because if some people get hit and you go over there and start CPR, you can bring them back right away pretty quickly. Yeah, I had training in CPR for, um, I was a lifeguard for years. So we they used to talk about uh, 
what's called a precordial thump where you pound on the chest. And now I think that the conclusion is that doesn't generate much electricity, but I think pumping on the chest, you know, may get the heart started again in that setting. I noticed too that most places you go now have defibrillators. Right. If it's any, you know, any kind of a public space. Well, you know, the whole, the whole, um, if you look at the uh, mortality of um, cardiac arrest, um, that's death, and that doesn't include morbidity, meaning resistant logic complaints. It's 24% and out of hospital cardiac arrest, and half of that in the hospital. Yeah. So when you when your heart stops, um, after about five minutes, you're starting to sustain irreversible brain damage. So that's why, you know, hopefully having a, a defibrillator, and that's why you've seen on a sporting event or something like that where somebody gets timely defibrillation, saves their life. Well, will the defibrillator let you know if that person doesn't need to be defibrillated? I mean, like if, it's uh, a if they know, thrombosis you know what you're doing. In other words, when you put the paddles on, it gives you rhythm. Okay. Now, if someone's there without a pulse, uh, I think an unconscious, you can probably assume that that's what's going on, but you will get a rhythm strip. I think someone who uses one of those should be trained to do it, but yeah. you, you will get a rhythm strip that'll, that would show they're either no rhythm or a, a, a rhythm like ventricular fibrillation. So it's not like a case if, if the person's got a coronary thrombosis and you try to defibrillate them, you'd blow their heart up or something. No, you wouldn't blow their heart up, but that's, that's not, I mean, someone, um, if you pass out from a heart attack, it means that your heart, you've suffered so much damage to your heart muscle that it's not pumping enough blood. That may be outside the context of um an arrhythmia okay but you're not going to you won't cause the heart to explode under any circumstance okay all right well thank you anybody else have any questions then i guess we can go ahead and uh thank you and, and close our meeting for tonight all right good night everyone good night thank, thank you Richard. thank you very much thank you sure